be with you again here at my second home, Skyline. <laughs> Welcome home. Yes. In a different season. That's why I wore my heavy robe. <laughs> this morning I came out the door and I was like, oh, let's oh, go no. back and redo that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to try to look all cool and slim. It's like, no, 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 no. A little too old for that. I want to thank uh, and remember Pastor Lori in her uh, absence and uh, her brother. Let us continue to pray for both of them and their entire <coughs> family and for others who are dealing with illness, grief, and challenge of any kind. Our scripture for the morning, it is, if you are one who follows the lectionary, it is the alternative uh, reading of the uh, lectionary text, the first uh, reading in the lectionary uh, this week. It was the one that spoke uh, to me most <laughs> prominently. It was the one that God said, I've got something for you to say about this. So what thus saith the Lord is what I thus saith to you. From Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 31, the New Revised Standard uh, Version, it is in your um, program. Uh, I think that it is the same translation as I am reading. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Such is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Loving and eternal God, we give you thanks for allowing us to yet again gather as your people empty cups before a full fountain, ready to be filled with wisdom, love, and grace from on high. Touch us with your hand of mercy. Open our minds, our hearts, and our ears that we might hear from you words that will empower us to live for you in the world in the days ahead. Speak now through your servant and let us all hear. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. The story in the text for today provides an embarrassment of riching for preaching possibilities. It's one of the most extensively interpreted stories from the book of Genesis and actually from the whole of the New Testament, and that is for good reason. It is peculiar, it is full of strange and mysterious things. The great biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann explains it this way. He says, its rich repository possibility is based in part 
on its lack of clarity, which permits various readings and interpretations. In fact, it is hard for those of us who preach to choose from among these many, many rich goodies for a single sermon. But allow me to try something this morning. Now, to really understand this story, we need to freshen up a little bit on what we know about Jacob. He's a familiar character to us. Jacob's name means deceiver and has various other monikers associated with them, but primarily deceiver. Jacob's entire life has been a, a struggle even from before his birth. Remember that we read in the Bible that he struggled with his twin mother, even in his mother's, with his twin brother, even in his mother's womb, so much so that his mother Rebecca asked God, why is this happening to me? When he arrived, he was the second born. And under the ancient laws of primogenitor, the oldest son got almost everything, which means that Jacob got almost nothing. He missed out on all the privileges of being the firstborn by only a few ticks and a few minutes of the clock. He is not only the younger of the two, but also the more slight of nature. And so he learns early on to live by his wits rather than by his muscles and his strength. And since birth, his entire life has been a struggle with many schemes. For example, Jacob exploited his brother so that Esau traded his birthright to him for a pot of stew. Jacob deceived his father, Isaac, so that his father blessed him and not Esau, who should have received the blessing. Jacob then had to run for his life to live with his uncle Laban, who was a deceiver himself. There, Jacob had to outwit Laban in order to get the wages that he had been promised, but that Laban had tried to deny him. After a total of about 20 years away from home working for Laban, J La Jacob is finally released from virtual bondage that he's in when God tells him to return to his home territory. It is time for him to return home because he is the child uh, of promise, a promise that God had given first to Abraham, then to Isaac, and now to Jacob, despite the fact that he came upon this in a surreptitious manner. He also is leaving his father-in-law on less than good terms. All of his life, Jacob has been angling and wrestling and deceiving to get ahead. This man who had fled alone and empty-handed from his brother's murderous anger will now return a wealthy man, married and with children. But he still must deal with his angry uncle who has pursued him for seven days and then that angry brother who looms somewhere off in the distance. Jacob's response to the threat of Esau's rage is typically Jacob. He develops a plan, a plot, a cunning way to calm, the, to calm Esau's anger, thus protecting his family and flocks and hopefully preserving his own life. Jacob sends a message to Esau, explaining where he has been and what he has become, and then pleading for mercy. He tells his messengers to tell uh, my brother that I've been away working with Uncle Laban for 20 years. I'm all together now, gotten over my problems and issues. I'm a nice guy now, no tricks. I'm on my way back, looking forward to seeing you. When his messengers come back, Jacob hears that his brother Esau is coming to meet him, accompanied by 400 of his men. Now to Jacob, this seems a little bit large for a welcoming party. So his response is to panic because he assumes that Esau is coming to attack him and some exact some revenge. The terrified Jacob then divides his servants and animals into two groups 
in hopes of saving at least half of what he has in the event that this is in fact an attack from his aggrieved brother. Then he has another idea. Aha, I'll send gifts ahead to uh, Esau and I'll try to win his favor. They will arrive before I do, so he should be in good spirits. We'll space them out so that they seem plentiful in uh, nature, and maybe it will uh, impress him and soften him up a little bit more. And oh yes, by the way, we see here Jacob do one more thing that we've never seen Jacob do before in preparation for meeting Esau. One thing he has not ever done in scripture before. Because you see, things now are becoming very real. Jacob is in a foxhole of sorts. And in the middle of all his wheeling and dealing are self-serving, self-persevering, self-sustaining, throw everyone else under the bus, me first, Jacob. For the first time in his life, he admits that he needs help and he turns to God in prayer. Remember now that Jacob didn't have a strong history of believing in God. If you will recall, once when he was speaking with his father Isaac, he referred to God as your God, Father. And up to now, all the encounters he has had with God have either been by dreams or visions, bailouts at God's initiation. We have nothing that suggests that Jacob has ever originated a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God himself. But now, in the foxhole, where everybody gets religion, he does. Mm -hmm. And now it's a nice, proper prayer in which he acknowledges the God of his forebearers, confesses his unworthiness, and begs God to save him from Esau, claiming God's covenant promises to him. Don't forget, I'm the child of the covenant. I'm the heir to the throne. But this prayer also sounds a lot like some of the psalmist and other petitioners in the Old Testament. When they make demands and they demand things of God. It seems there is almost an arrogance on their part as they often speak back God's very own words to God and they call God out on the promises that they made and claim them as rightfully theirs. They have no problem at all reminding God, hey God, you said now it's time to deliver. Jacob prays, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, God, you're the one who told me, go back to your parents' homeland and I'll treat you well. You yourself said, I will treat you well. I will make your descendants like the sands of the sea, far too many to count. Now it's time for you to deliver on that promise, O oh Lord. If some of us are honest, Jacob's prayers sound a little bit like prayers that you and I probably have said when we were afraid, desperate, and in trouble. When plan B didn't work, and there is no plan C. It is not at all different from the pleading and the begging and the deal-making prayers we make in the dark times when hope is fading and options are limited. You promised, O oh Lord, that you would heal, but my parents are still sick. Do something now, Lord, please. You promised that you would provide for us, but we're facing foreclosure. Help me now, Lord. You said you would look out for my children, but they don't seem to be in a safe situation. Where are you, Lord? come through in the way that you promised. When we meet Jacob in this morning's text, he is sending his wives and children across the Jabbok River. The Jabbok is an eastern tributary of the Jordan River located about 20 miles north of the Dead uh, Sea. 
It is known for the surrounding beauty, and it comes off of a big clip and goes down into a deep valley where it thins out, and this is what a ford is. A ford is a, a shallow part of a lake or a body of water where one can cross and will come up to about uh, the waist. And so he sends his wife, their servants, and final belongings over across. The river's name, Jabbok, plays on the name Jacob. Jacob is Yaakov in Hebrew, and Jabbok is Yavok. Uh, they use the same letters. They are just rearranged uh, differently. Both of those words are related to the word wrestle. Both the family and the river serve as a kind of shield for Jacob between himself and Esau. That sounds nice on the one hand, but kind of kind of scandalous on the other hand. He sent his wife and children to be a shield from 400 marauding men. Hmm. Nice guy, Jacob. Having carried out this complex and intricate plan, the Bible says Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. This unidentified man is one of the strange and mysterious things that make this passage peculiar and powerful. Who is this? Some interpreters suggest that it was Esau, but nothing in the text bears that out. This anonymous wrestling partner could also symbolize others with whom Jacob had wrestled in his life including his father Isaac, or his father-in-law Laban, even perhaps his mother Rebecca, who joined him in conspiracy more than once. Or perhaps this uninvited antagonist was Jacob's own dark inner self. Jacob doesn't know who it is at first, but as they wrestle on through the night, it begins to become apparent to him that this is a divine being. This is not just a normal man. And then it seems to be confirmed in verse 28. We'll get to that in a moment. There is very little detail given to any of the specifics about the wrestling match, except for how long it lasts. It says that it lasts until the dawn is about to break. So that's a pretty long fight. But why would God, in the form of a man, attack this child of the covenant in the middle of the night? And if this is God, why didn't he pin Jacob to the crown in a moment, make him say uncle like on wrestling and get the referee over there and it's over and they pop up and do whatever they do? Why did the fight last all night long? Well, perhaps. This God-man laid aside his almighty power for this encounter, even as a later God-man would do for us. Perhaps for the purpose of saving this chosen one of God, Jacob, God had to enter into human history and human flesh with a willingness to experience weakness in the same way that Jesus did to save God's children. When Jacob finally demands the blessing, the man responds with a curious question. What is your name? Jacob, he says. It sounds irrelevant until the man answers. They're wrestling and so forth, and it's like, hey, by the way, buddy, what's your name? Hmm. <clears throat> but the man says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. You have struggled with God and man and have overcome. And there is where we get the suggestion that this divine being is God personified in the flesh. 
although God doesn't give the blessing until a few minutes later, those words are essentially the blessing. Jacob is given a new identity as the man who struggles with God, which is the meaning of the name Israel, the one who struggles with God. And if you think about it, that is the identity of the people of Israel to this day. We who struggle with God. A better translation, though, is the one who struggles with the God who struggles with humans. In that new name, we see the complexity of the covenant between God and God's people. The almighty sovereign Yahweh reaches down in grace to take an unworthy people by the hand in order to bless them. But they, in turn, must hold on to God's hand in order to receive that blessing, not letting go. Salvation is indeed totally by grace, but it is also through faith. God dispenses grace. God's people hold on in faith. God could overwhelm and force us to do God's bidding, but God chooses to enter our darkness in human form, sometimes even with force and attacking, if you will, sometimes comforting, sometimes convicting, sometimes converting, but always in the mix and mixing it up with us. The way of salvation is always the way of incarnation in the flesh, in the real world. It is not this idea of being a follower and a believer is not simply a mental exercise. It is not simply a pious getaway and hideaway away from the reality of the world. God own self comes in and mixes it up, even with one who has deceived, even with one who has cheated, even with one who has gone far off the road from where they should have been, God still struggles with us. It is mysterious sometimes messy, sometimes miserable, but God's work is always miraculous. Somewhere during this wrestling match, Jacob becomes aware that he needs divine blessing more than anything else. He fashions himself as quite clever, quite proud of himself that he took advantage of the stupid, dim-witted brother of mine, and I got all of the blessing. Very proud of himself that he outdeceived his uncle Laban, who was quite the deceiver himself, with the thing with the cows, you know, he had the speckled cows, and he said, give me the speckled uh, cows, and I will take that for um, my pay. Uncle Laban, you don't have to pay me money, just give me the cows. And any cows that are not uh, uh, like this, then you will have those and they will be great. Well, he buys the scheme where all the cows came out. <laughs> and, and Laban ended up with nothing. He was proud of himself. He's like, man, I am clever, you know. I'm mama's baby boy. Whew. Don't you love me? So somewhere during this wrestling, when we see that God, the text tells us that uh, God saw that he did not prevail uh, against him and that Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. It's not like Jacob had gotten swollen, as the kids say, and then <laughs> people got a headlock and could, God couldn't get out. He realized, I need God. I can't do this by myself. 
more than all of his efforts, more than all of his plans, he needed divine blessing. And he held on. Everything depended on the blessing that God would give him. So Jacob hung on for dear life. And the text tells us, and it was there that he blessed him. It didn't mean there in that place, because they had already been there. There was when he was ready, when he recognized, I need this blessing. I'm not demanding anything from God. I can't make it without God. And it was there when he transformed him, when he blessed him and turned him and transformed him into something else. At that time, he sees that he is not able to prevail, and he responds. God sees that, and he decides, right before this, when Jacob is still kind of a little bit filled with himself, a little bit filled with him, himself, and he says, you know what, I'm going to just put a little touch on you to give you a reminder and he does it on the hip because, you know, our hips give us balance. If your hip uh, is bad, then you're, you know, you're going to have to be a little bit more steady. Your gait is not quite as quick uh, as it used to be. You're not quite as cool as you once were. Uh, and you'll always be reminded that, hmm, yes, I need to pay attention. I need to get my balance and get my bearings. and. Uh, position myself just right in order to stay upright and to be able to move forward. In this particular detail, we get a glimpse of the power of this man who couldn't defeat Jacob but could cripple him. He could have beaten him in a moment, but for the sake of Jacob's salvation, the wrestling match had to continue, and Jacob had to hold on for dear life in order to receive that blessing. But still, Jacob does not let go. In chapter, in verse 26, the wrestling partner voices his request that Jacob do so because dawn is breaking. One scholar points out that the danger is not that God would be harmed by the daylight. He's not a vampire or anything, although you had a lot of folk uh, tales in that era where uh, the, the, the vampire thing uh, plays out. But Jacob would be the one harmed. If Jacob holds on until day, daybreak, he is dead because text tells us you cannot see the face of God and live. Could not see the face of God and live. But Jacob still refuses to let go until he receives the blessing. When Jacob fairly demands the blessing, the man responds with this question, what is your name, what is your name, what is your name? This new identity that comes from struggling with God. But before that, and in giving the name, is the confession, because the name doesn't just symbol a marker for you are this person or this is a chair. It has substance to it. It tells your character. It tells your history, where you came from, as well as your destiny. Jacob, in turn, asks the stranger, well, what is your name? And of course, the stranger, the divine being, says nothing in return. Why do you ask my name, he says. Is Jacob just being polite or engaging in a little tete -a, -tete, a little tit for tat? Don't think so. It could be perhaps that Jacob wants to know God's name so that Jacob can control God. Because in the ancient world, if you knew a God's name, you could call on him and demand a blessing when you had the power of naming. 
then you were the one in control. Think about the creation story when God brought forth Adam and allowed Adam, Adam to name animals. But God had named all of the other uh, things. So naming was a powerful, powerful thing. That is part of the reasoning, not giving his name, is part of the reasoning behind the third commandment about taking God's name in vain. Do not use God's name the way the pagans use the names of their God to control and manipulate them. And wouldn't it be just like Jacob to try to manipulate God? So God refuses to tell Jacob his name. Instead, he blesses him anyhow. God is unimaginably gracious, but God is also sovereign. And God chooses to remain mysterious. Jacob's last words are prophetic and a bit presumptuous. He names the place of his wrestling Peniel, explaining, it is because I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Well, Jacob, not exactly. You didn't actually see God's actual face because God was disguised as a man, and it was too dark to see at all. Indeed, the text points to that in verse 31 when it says, the sun rose above him as he passed by Peniel. Before that, the sun had not risen. This was all done in the dark. That's why in John's gospel, in the stunning introduction to the word becoming flesh, he says, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. We know God through Jesus. The world knows God through us. We know the God who wrestles with us and blesses us through the Son of God who wrestled in our humanity with all of the enemies of human existence. Jesus came in order to wrestle with danger, to wrestle with hate, to wrestle with racism, to wrestle with sexism, materialism, militarism, violence, poverty, disease, even as the Son of God incarnate is still marked by the wounds inflicted in his battle, so every one of us limps wounded in one way or another through life, marked by God as one who has struggled with God and prevailed by faith. Where's your limp? How did God touch you during your wrestling? Certainly, we all experience time when we feel as if we have been wrestling with God. And many of us are indeed marked by the wounds we have sustained from our struggles. Our limp might not be as obvious as Jacob's was, but if we're honest, we have all been touched in some painful way by the God who blesses us. This text reminds us that God is wrestling with us and that we grow in that process. Our wounds are a mark of victory, a badge of courage, old war wound wounds that remind us of C.S. Lewis's famous words about Aslan, the great lion in the Chronicles of Narnia. He said, of course he isn't safe, but he is good, very good. God is good all the time. Let's wrestle. Amen. And for our hymn of response, we will have New Century Hymnal, page 472, Precious Lord.